came with few. Throughout the fall and winter, most of our programs will be held in this digital space due to COVID-19. With this new Zoom platform, which is the webinar, you can see us, but unfortunately we can't see you. So at this time, I just wanna take a second and find uh, for you to find the chat feature and let us know that you're in the building, uh, that you're here in the place, in the space, you're alive and you're doing well. So just take a second and drop your name and where you're from in the chat. Throughout the afternoon, uh, feel free to interact with one another through this chat feature. Do not put your questions there. Put your questions in the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to answer them. We'll also be conducting polls throughout the afternoon to better understand your positions and get to know you a little better. So take a second and answer the polls that pop up on your screen and exercise your right to participate or not to participate. Today's program, Community as Classroom, bearing witness to COVID-19 and examining the history of public health and the impact of infectious diseases on the Black community in the United States is a very important discussion for us to have. As many of you know, who have been following the news, this has impacted uh, the Black community uh, in a disproportionate way than the rest of American citizens. Uh, and the program is also very special because we get to welcome back home two very special and esteemed guests, uh, Harriet A. Washington, a medical ethicist and author of Medical Apartheid, and Dr. Samuel K. Roberts, Associate Professor of History, uh, Sociomedical Sciences, and African American and African Diaspora Studies at Columbia University. Both of our uh, panelists uh, teach at Columbia University. So big up to Columbia University who helped support us uh, in bringing this program to you today. They will be in conversation with our oral historian uh, and oral history project manager, Obdin Mondazir, and that will begin at 1 p.m. Uh, from 2 to 3 p.m., we'll open the floor for questions from the community to so bring us all your questions. A handful of them will be selected and answered live. Folks who have been to Weeksville weekends on the historic grounds of the Weeksville Heritage Center um, know that Weeksville weekend is the time when we offer free guided tours of our, of our historic Hunter Fly Road houses, which are listed on the National Registry of Historic Places and our New York City landmarks. They are our most prized possessions, uh, the greatest holdings that we have in our collection. They were preserved and restored by you, the community, and they are monuments of black power and black self-determination. So, um, Uh, but unfortunately, uh, due to COVID-19, we're not able to offer tours at this time. So I hope that this video will suffice. Back in February of 2018, Messiah Rhodes and the Vice team visited the Heritage Center and the historic Hunter Fly Road houses, and they created this lovely little film. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a day in Weeksville, Brooklyn's historic free town. Welcome to the Weeksville Heritage Center. Even before slavery ended, there was a vibrant black town right in the middle of Brooklyn that almost disappeared from the history books. We're here to check out the culture and institutions unique to Weeksville and see what happened to this free black town. Weeksville uh, was a free 19th century African settlement that was established in 1838 prior to the end of the Civil War. So at this time, most black people in America are in slavery, and this was a free black community. It had its own school, its own church, a house for the orphans and single moms. So it had all of these institutions and they were all black run and black led. In the midst of all this chaos and violence, they could come and live in Weeksville and be safe. So this was a safe space before people coined that term, safe space. Yeah, it was a safe haven, it was a refuge. It was a place of protection. Mm -hmm. So I got this 21st century garb on. It's hard to blend in in this town. The Weeksville staff has let me borrow one of their outfits. 
This is the old and new blended in right here in Reeseville. How's the look? Okay. So let's go inside. Let's go back to the 1860s. Yeah, I can't wait. Let's okay. go. Wipe your feet. Yep. What's going on with this newspaper? This is the Freedman's Torchlight. It was printed right here in Brooklyn in December of 1866. And this was the newspaper of Weeksville. And this newspaper was really important because it served as a teaching tool, right, to teach newly freed Africans how to read and write. And then it also told you how to conduct your life as a freed person. My favorite is the maxims to guide a young man. These are the rules you need to know. Keep good company or none. Never be idle. Never be idle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if your hands cannot be usefully employed, attend to the cultivation of your mind. Mm. So people would be sitting in the newspaper, chilling, reading, cooking their stew or mm -hmm. chicken or... Telling stories, telling stories, singing songs. Yeah, it would kind of put my PlayStation in my Xbox. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> None of that you had to read back then. <laughs> So where are we going next? Let's go to the 1900s. Oh. So this house um, would be a typical middle class house. Here on the mantle are actual photos from our archives. And all of these folks lived here in Weeksville. And here's our baseball team. What? I can't believe they have their own team. That must have been dope. This is when you see Weeksville begin to change, right? So it goes from being isolated, rural, to being more metropolitan. And in the yeah. 1900s, you see Weeksville School become integrated, right? Mm -hmm. So color school number two is one of the first schools in the U.S. to have black teachers teaching white students. Mm -hmm. And that happened in the late 1860s mm -hmm. here in Weeksville. Mm -hmm. So you see that integrated school right here in Weeksville back in the day yep. in a calm way, not have tomatoes thrown at you. And exactly. It wasn't, guard. there was no violence to do it. We were civilized and we just talked about it. Yeah, and yeah. We made it work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's go to the 1930s. That baby kind of scares me a little bit. It scares you too? Oh, wow. It scares all the kids too. They all run. So these are dolls from the 1930s. And which is really cool about these dolls are that during that time, you couldn't even find black dolls. What? So you had to paint your dolls. And so these dolls are actually painted. And if you look close, you can see them. Oh, I can see it. And so now to even have black dolls, that was a struggle that had to be won to have dolls that look like you. It's part of the black experience, right? Just being creative and building your own reality with the pieces that's around, you know? Yep, exactly. And so that's the end of Weeksville, essentially, after this time in the 1930s, because they built this grid system and the community began to change. They got absorbed into Bedford-Stuyvesant. So the small little village life that you had it changed because now you're a part of a bigger community, right? And if you don't have any places, any institutions, any centers for those people to come together to create a unified way of thinking or way of life, then you don't have a community. I hope that the Weeksville Heritage Center becomes um, a sort of mecca of black liberation like it was in the 1860s so that this can really be an institution, right, that the ancestors had dreamed of I'm from New York City, I'm from Queens. So to grow up so close to this place and not know about it until I'm a grown ass man is kind of shocking. Because this is not only a, a space in the past, this is a space to bring forward into the future. The intentions of the people here was to be a free space for black people, but for all people, you know, to set the standard of how everyone should be treated. I think that's what Weeksville represents. Oh, I love that video. That was so fun uh, working with Uzziah, putting him in costume. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Um, wow, I was very, very pregnant in that video. Um, <laughs> uh, so I just want to take a second um, and share some fun facts with you guys. Um, 
Okay, so first off, I want to correct some misinformation that I shared in the video um, and correct this with the world finally. Um, so the Weeksville school that I mentioned in the video, uh, PS 83, as it was known back then, uh, was established as an officially integrated or mixed race school, not in the 1860s, but in 1891 when it became PS 68. So I just want to show you guys uh, an historic photo of PS 68. So there it is, uh, PS 68 is still standing here in Brooklyn uh, on Schenectady and Bergen. Uh, and you can see that school is still standing today. I think it's being turned into housing. Um, I wish it was um, affordable housing, but I'm not sure what type of housing it's gonna be turned into, but it's still there. Um, and so you guys can uh, check that out when you're strolling through Brooklyn. Okay, so another fun fact I wanna share uh, with everybody, um, integrated in 1891. Uh, Messiah Rhodes, who you saw in the video uh, and our panelists, Harriet A. Washington, were both on Democracy Now. Uh, um, Messiah was on Democracy Now in August. I'm not sure if you guys caught that. I think it was August 14th, he was on the show and he was sharing his, uh, recently, his recently featured um, new documentary called Against All Odds, where he shares a personal story about his mother growing up, um, him growing up with his mother in and out of jail um, and dealing with the um, with uh, incarceration. And um, I just want to shout out Messiah Rhodes. He's a really good brother. And that film that he is has produced is really important right now. Um, I think police brutality and police murder must be addressed within uh, the larger society. But we can't forget about the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration, which steals Black lives every day, every year. Um, so I think that's really important. And Messiah calls this documentary Against All Odds uh, a direct answer to the call to defund the police. You know, instead of giving law enforcement agencies billions of dollars to purchase tanks and sci fi weaponry, he says, you know, this money could be given to uh, housing, education, family reunification, mental health support, um, and health care to the individuals and uh, families and communities that have been affected um, by the prison industrial complex. So racial justice uh, includes many aspects of societal transformation. So let's not forget that. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, last fun fact, as I said, um, Harriet A. Washington was on Democracy Now! This week, I don't know if you guys caught that, um, but it was on Thursday. So I'm really excited that she's here with us uh, to share her tremendous knowledge and expertise with our community. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce um, our moderator for today's discussion, uh, Obden Mondazir. Obdin Mondazir is an outreach archivist and adjunct lecturer at Queens College, City University of New York, and an oral historian working at Weeksville Heritage Center, a multidisciplinary house museum dedicated to preserving the history of the 19th century free Black community of Weeksville, Brooklyn. At Queens College, he's recently worked on developing an OER-based curriculum in archival theory and practice at the Graduate School and Library and Information Studies. He also collects interviews on the SEEK program. The SEEK program, which stands for Search for Education, Ele Elevation, and Knowledge, and was legislated into being in 1966 as a vehicle to integrate CUNY senior colleges and provide comprehensive academic support to assist capable students who otherwise might not be able to attend college. At Weeksville Heritage Center, um, he developed, uh, he develops public programming and he has conducted and presented on several community-based oral history projects that focused on education, Black joy, and Black-owned restaurants in Central Brooklyn. Obden has a dual MA in library science uh, and uh, from his, from Queens College, and he's the recipient of a West African African excuse me West African Research Center Library Fellowship, uh, and the City Center for Culture uh, and a Queens Library Fellowship. Let's welcome our brother Obden Mondazir. Thank you for that. That was that was a long introduction and um, more than I deserve, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Obden, I'm going to pass the baton to you, and I'll see you guys a bit later. All right. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this virtual teaching that we're having. 
which is titled, uh, again, Community as Classroom Bearing Witness to COVID-19 and examining the history of public health and the impact of infectious diseases on the Black community in the United States. Uh, we have our esteemed speakers, Harriet A. Washington and Dr. Samuel Roberts. And uh, I, as an oral historian or oral history practitioner, uh, the term Barrick Witness does bear a lot of weight for me just um, as it is a term that I use in my work a lot. And it's used in psychology to refer to the sharing of experience with others, uh, most, not most notably in communication of traumatic experiences. Uh, Maya Angelou has said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. At this moment, I would like to couch the history of the 19th century community of Weeksville, as well as Weeksville Heritage Center within this conversation of public health and the Black community. Historically, we have Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, uh, who in 1847 was the first African-American woman to graduate from medical school in New York and was born free in New York to a prominent African-American land-owning family in Weeksville. Um, this is pertinent to the conversation as it's evidence to the longstanding um, barrier that African-Americans have had to face in trying to enter the medical professional field. Um, so one else I wanted to mention was that uh, J.H. Gordon, who was a clergyman and superintendent of Weeksville's Howard Colored Orphan Asylum, which is mentioned in the video. And in 1906, he helped win Oda Benga, Oda Benga, who was a captive Congolese pygmy that was exhibited along with primates at the Bronx Zoo. Uh, he helped fight for the release um, from, this, from the zoo and gave refuge to him at uh, the Howard Orpham Asylum. And uh, Benga's tragedy illustrates the, how American scientists found black bodies useful even when they were not trying new medications or surgeries and also shows the commodification of black bodies as spectacle. Um, and this example is also mentioned in Harriet Washington's uh, Medical Apartheid. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Weeksville Heritage Center uh, for their week so weeks uh, for Weeksville weekends in September, uh, titled Race and Reprodu Reproduction, Healing Justice and Hillary History. We held a panel discussion on public monuments and symbolic justice, which focused on the events leading to the removal of the Marion Sims statue from central Brooklyn. Um, from there, we looked at the racialized history and violence of gynecology in the United States, and also uh, looked at debates about pub public monuments and its symbolic and, symbolic and artistic interpretations. Uh, we invited Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, author of Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the, or the Origins of American Gynecology, uh, well, as well as artist Dorian Garner, who um, did the work titled White Man on a Pedestal, and activist Jewel Cadet, as well as scholar Nicole Ivey, who was the panelist for this discussion. And currently, we are conducting oral history interviews uh, with members, community members of Central Brooklyn and Weeksville. And we've decided to start with the Weeksville staff to focus on the social phenomena that is this worldwide pandemic in the United States, as well as look at the intensification of the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality. And now I'm going to read the bios of our esteemed panelists. I will first start with Harriet A. Washington. Uh, Harriet A. Washington has delivered more than 200 invited lectures and ground rounds, mostly to universities and schools of medicine, including John Hopkins University, Harvard Medical School, the Harvard School of Public Health, Columbia University, Stanford Law School, the University of Chicago, Vassar College, the Mayo Clinic, Eth uh, Zurich Zentrum, Universität zu Lübeck Geschichte, um, Theory, Ethic de Medicine, the 16th European Conference on Computational Biology in Vienna, Austria, and the Brochure Institute of Hermans in Geneva. Um, and she is also the author of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation, 
and Black Americans from colonial times to the present. And her latest book is A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind. Um, welcome, Harriet. Thank you very much, um, Optin, for that very generous introduction. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. All right, great. And uh, we have our second panelist, uh, Dr. Samuel Kelton Roberts. Uh, he is an associate professor of history, sociomedical, sociomedical sciences, and African American and African diaspora studies at Columbia University. At Columbia, he also leads the research cluster on the historical study of race in the and co-directs the Lehman Center for American History. Roberts is a former director of Columbia University's Institute for Research in African American Studies. He writes, teaches, and lectures widely on African American social history, medical and public health history, harm reduction and drug policy, as well as criminal justice, policing, and social policy. Dr. Roberts is the author of the widely acclaimed Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation, and is currently writing a book tentatively titled the, To Enter Which Doesn't Want Them, sorry, To Enter a Society Which Doesn't Want Them, Race, Recovery, and America's Misadventures in Drug Policy, a project covering the history of addiction treatment, harm reduction, and political inclusion from the 1950s to the 1990s. In 2018, Dr. Roberts launched the podcast series, People Doing Interesting Stuff, which is available on iTunes and other podcasting platforms, in which he speaks with people working in public health and social justice, especially in regards to harm reduction, HIV AIDS work, reproductive justice, and criminal justice reform. He is also the co-host along with Dr. Mabel O. Wilson of the podcast series, Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19. Uh, and he tweets from at Samuel K. Roberts. And I just want to mention that I've been listening to Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19 and have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so welcome, Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much, Hopeton. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes, um, as am I. And uh, I just wanted to uh, start with this first question where um, I would love for both of our panelists to talk about um, how did you arrive to your work involving racial health inequities in the US and what are some of the things that have been revealed to you early on looking at the response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Harry, would you like to take the first one on that? Take a... <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, I first became aware of um, this crisis, ongoing crisis in uh, health inequities when I worked in hospitals, a teaching hospital in upstate New York in the 1970s and early 1980s. Nobody was talking about it then, but you could not help working at that hospital to see very clearly evidence of these disparities, not only in where patients were being um, you know, boarded and the composition of the medical staff. But when I worked in the poison center, managing a poison control center, I came across case files of people who were in terminal kidney failure. And I saw that the white patients tended to have thick files documenting their suitability to receive organs for transplantation. Whereas the black patients had thinner files without the um, social profile and the, um, basically the case made by staff that they would be good candidates for transplantation. On one file, um, in fact, on all the files, the social profile was stamped Negro. So there was no confusion the staff about who was white and who was black. And on one of the files, um, a doctor I knew had written um, that the plan for the staff was to prepare the patient for his imminent demise. And that patient was African-American. And I knew this doctor well, I was completely shocked that this Christian moral doctor should be saying, we're just going to help this guy die. We're not even gonna look for an organ. Of course, I couldn't be certain that it wasn't the clinical profile that was driving this, but I had my suspicions. And ever since that day, when I found those files, I have been amassing information to document um, my fears and later my certainty that Black African Americans were indeed being treated very differently by the establishment. The really curious thing is that um, 
by the year 2001, when I went to a history of medicine conference that had scholars from around the world, except for Africa, um, build the global conference. And all these history of medicine scholars were assuring me that nothing had been done to African-Americans ex except for Tuskegee. That was it, they said. They were quite sure of this. And I was quite sure they were wrong. So I had a bit of a combination detective <laughs> mentality and also a campaign to unearth the truth because it certainly was not in the medical canon. That's the root of my obsession. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you, Ovid, and I've been looking, and thank you to Weeksville and to all of our partners in this. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think Harriet and I were on a panel for Weeksville, wasn't it, Harriet, like yes. some years ago? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So this is, we'll call this our reunion tour uh, <laughs> in that regard. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so I, I got into this work uh, really through uh, my concern. I've been a a, a student of African-American history since really since high school or middle school, um, and then took it on as a major in college. And as I decided that I wanted to be uh, somebody who wrote about this history, I was struck how our narrative of, we'll just say black history in general, but also the, the political history is one in uh, which, or at least at the time had been one very much of disembodiment that these struggles, that these community formations, that these you know, political, social, cultural practices, in a lot of ways had been taken by scholars to be without bodies themselves. That's changed over the past. I was in graduate school in the late 1990s. So that's changed quite a bit since then. But at the time, um, that's, that was kind of the state of, of the art at the point. And I, I in looking around, and these are arguments that I've made later on and um, more at length, what I think I came to understand, or what I, uh, what I think I believe about, about the historiography of this period is that we had forgotten how much infectious disease was part of our life and our politics and our culture because we had vanquished a lot of infectious disease by the 1950s or so. Some of the worst scourges of you know, the world and particularly for African Americans and, and people who are of, you know, working class or, or the working poor were, you know, diseases such as tuberculosis or, you know, typhoid and, and a, a host of others, which were very much part of the landscape, but did not make into the historiography that had been written after 1960 or so. Then the narrative was about the struggle for rights in a very much kind of, abs not abstract, but more or less disembodied way. And so a lot of my work was to reconsider that and continues to be that as well. So looking forward to this conversation. And once again, thank you to all of everybody in the audience. And again, thank you to Weeksville. Um, thank you both for your, uh, your description of your arrival to this work. And uh, while you were both speaking, um, Harriet, uh, what, as, as an archivist, I, I was thinking about the files I was titled Negro. Um, and thinking about Truyo, Michel Rob Truyo, and his description of the power of naming. And um, in regards to this pandemic there, and talking about research and data collection uh, in regards to violence, I think about epistemic violence and that um, to name something um, as Negro and seeing that the files are smaller makes me think um, uh, of epistemic violence and how that affects um, particular ontologies, especially in regards to race. And um, the, the, I guess my next question that I wanted to ask is like, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, what has been revealed to you in regards to um, how uh, the pandemic has like specifically affected black and brown communities? Well, there's a rich, um, there are many things. But one of the things that struck me first was something you've alluded to, and that was the very, very poor data keeping. Why did we not know until we were well into it that this pandemic was affecting um, people of color so much more profoundly? We didn't know it because of decisions that were made to simply restrict data collection. Not only did um, 
uh, President Trump decided to disband the group whose job it was to monitor the data and analyze it. But we also had a CDC that was reluctant to collect racial data because they were convinced or said they were convinced that it could be collected through socioeconomics, which is an error. That's not true. You can't collect um, racial profiles through socioeconomics, but that's what they chose to do. That shouldn't have happened because, of course, we had this has been preceded not only by HIV, in which you can have these are people of color in this country, but also by things like HCV, hepatitis C infection, which just affected African Americans 20% more. We should have been looking for this. We should not have been blindsided. And then once we did, I see now the discourse troubles me because a lot of the talk about um, high rates among people of color focuses on blame the victim analyses, what are black people doing that puts them at higher risk, which is completely erroneous and inappropriate, far from supported by the data. And also by a confusion in which people think that it's race as opposed to racism that is causing the vulnerability. You know, basically the vulnerability is, is proceeding along racial fault lines that have been laid down a long time ago. Less access to healthcare, less access to, oh, greater access to environmental insults that weaken people, all the risk factors for coronavirus 19, as I mentioned in my Nature article, um, dovetail quite nicely with environmental racism. Um, kidney disease, um, immunocompromise, these are all things that are caused by environmental racism. And that's not the only um, risk factor, of course, but it's a good example of how other risk factors um, that have long hampered the health of African Americans are increasing our disease rates and deaths from coronavirus 19. Oh, then am I to answer the same question or? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would first of all, echo that and agree a thousand percent with Harriet, with what Harriet just said, as I often find is the case when she and her are speaking. Um, I would add to that as well that there's also, again, a sort of historical amnesia about how we collect data and how we think about epidemiology itself. We've had, um, at least at the federal level, uh, a really long period, a, a number of decades, where the type of attitude towards data collection that, that Harriet just mentioned has been the regnant attitude and uh, in which we have not really thought very closely or carefully about, um, as Harriet said, racism and also structural inequities as well. And I say it's amnesia because there was a time in from the 1930s through the, you know, until like early Cold War period, maybe to like 1950s or so, where that, uh, the idea of social medicine and social epidemiology, what later became social epidemiology, was part of our intellectual landscape. And that was more or less evacuated out of the discussions um, in the 19, really 80s and 1990s when we hit our, our, our federal neoliberalism and how we think about public health. And all that's coming back, these are like the chickens coming home to roost. Yeah. Our generation or two of willful ignorance of the dynamics that Harry just laid out um, has set us up for this. Because I think those of us who've been paying attention as historians or as people who are invested in social epidemiology and the investigation of health inequities. You know, our reaction when we heard this news back in, what was it, uh, March, late March, early April, about uh, differentials in mortality and morbidity, our reaction was kind of a collective, yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Um, but it caught our nation's epidemiologists and health officials and, of course, our political leadership, leadership by surprise. And it should not have. These are... This is kind of almost commonsensical if you haven't deliberately forgotten the lessons we've learned over the past century. Yes. And um, I've heard people say that like uh, this COVID-19 is, you know, uh, a biological issue as well as a political issue at the same time. And uh, I appreciate hearing this discussion on uh, a particular amnesia that seems to be happening, especially when we're thinking about um, this issue and how it's just mapped along the racial fault lines that already exist. And uh, it makes me think of uh, 
the the ethics of data collection and also uh, the importance of like oral history testimony and uh, the oral tradition, which you both um, use in your work. Uh, Dr. Roberts, through your through your podcast, I've listened to you talk to um, like multiple people between uh, academics as well as frontline workers and having them share their to testimony and their experiences during this pandemic. And, um, and Harriet, uh, in your book, you discuss uh, medical apartheid, you discuss the issues of the oral tradition not included within the, the medical canon. And um, basically how there is a tradition of Black folk telling them, telling each other that yes, we have been experimented uh, on each other in that way. So um, I would love to like bring this conversation to the the ethics of data collection and uh, or continue it further from like you know the CDC uh, misappropriation of of doing that work and uh, just thinking about um, other forms of data collection that has been used, especially in regards to um, oral tradition and what's been passed from mouth to mouth. Hmm. I guess, is it my turn to go first this time, Harriet, or? Oh, uh... be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that, Ogden. And, um, and, uh, and, and saying that, I also wanna first uh, highlight the work that you've been doing in collecting oral histories uh, in Queens during this pandemic, which is really the important work here. And before we talk, before we have any discussion about data, I think as you as you alluded in the question, um, all of that must be accompanied with an effort to talk to people who are most affected, most directly impacted, and also an expansive view of what data is. Data need not always be a fetish for statistical um, for numbers collection. Uh, data is, is a wide range of, 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 of information and, and, and pieces of, uh, uh, of insights, shall we say. That said, I think, you know, going back to the previous question, how we collect the data is very important, but also how we analyze it as well. Like, uh, you know, data can tell you a lot of things depending on, you know, what you do to massage it, how you interpret it, um, et cetera, et cetera. We need to really think closely about uh, the ethics of how we collect it. And by ethics, I don't mean necessarily about abuses per se, even though that is entirely possible. But I think an ethics of care on a, a political ethic of care in which we think very closely about who are the people that we're studying for this and who are the people uh, that we're serving in these efforts as well. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for, because I also want to hear what Harriet has to say on this as well. Well, I think what you've spoke, just spoken about is um, keenly important. Data manipulation is one thing, but elision of data is also very important here. There are data that are simply ignored. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't support a prevailing narrative. So we pretend, I shouldn't say we, um, certain scientists pretend that they just don't exist. Very often today, they're not fitting the political narrative. So they're like, and I think a really good example of that um, is Dr. Anthony Fauci, who clearly is a hero in this struggle. However, I'm concerned about something he said um, when he was exhorting, as many people are, exhorting African Americans to join COVID 19 vaccine trials. I've been disturbed by the way this argument is being framed because there's a lot of, um, again, a subtle blame the victim message here, a lot of dialogue about how success of a vaccine will depend upon African-American participation. And by not participating, African-Americans are somehow impeding or threatening success of the vaccine. Fauci then said the goal is approximately 27% of the subjects to be African-Americans. And I immediately thought, why should that be when African-Americans are 13.3% of the population? Um, I understand that statistically there might be an advantage in having an overrepresentation in numbers, but that still does not um, answer the ethical question of why are you exhorting African Americans to participate in such a high level um, and then cascading them for not doing that. My understanding is that right now African Americans are participating around 10%, very near the representation hit in the population. Frankly, 
we're representing well. We're doing a good job. We're participating at a what I consider an ethical rate, and yet we're being, you know, there's a lot of uh, complaints and a lot of castigating them. The problem, another problem, is that this reflects a general tendency to blame African Americans for the scavenges of the coronavirus 19. Even our Surgeon General, unfortunately, when he spoke in April, exhorted people of color mm. not to drink and not to smoke. He didn't talk about the fact that people of color were being treated differently when they managed to get to hospital medical care. He didn't mention the fact that people of color have disease rates that are so much higher, put them at risk. He didn't mention the fact that people of color were um, living in areas where hospital tended to close, close near them. All these things that are make you know people of color the victims of this pandemic were ignored for him to exhort them to change their behaviors. That we were behaving in a way to set ourselves up, and it's a big problem, I think, because it's um, important, especially for a surgeon general, any doctor. It's important to look at the barriers to good care, not to act like they're not there, and cherry pick data to pretend that African-Americans are causing their own health problems. Um, it's quite, it's a betrayal, quite frankly. Uh, so I, it's problematic on a lot of levels, but basically on an ethical level. This should not be done to any group of people. And, and you know, Harry, that what you brought up about um, Dr. Fauci uh, at the top of your comments, you know, it, the other thing that, about that is that he never really told us why he needs us there, let alone at 27%. I mean, I think we know, but I, I'm not sure that all of the, I mean, you and I know, and maybe maybe many of the people um, in our audience knows, but the country doesn't know. Just to, just to kind of blanket say, we need more black people, otherwise this thing fails. It's like, well, why is that? You know, because I, I think a lot of people might make the assumption that it's a genetic thing, which I'm not really convinced that the evidence is there to show a genetic issue with COVID and African-Americans. He needs to spell it out saying, we need black people here because they have been the canaries in the gold, in the coal mine. They are the ones who more um, in, in higher preponderance are working in gig economies where they're economic, economically vulnerable, who are more disproportionately housing insecure and food insecure or living in neighborhoods that are hot spots. And I don't think he's ever really spelled that out. And I think you and I can speculate why, given to who his boss is. <laughs> um, yes. But it might also speak to his orientation. And I think we all admire him and his intellect and his dedication. But you know, this is also kind of an example of how we've been doing epidemi epidemiology for the past 30 or 40 years. That, as you said, divorced from considerations of, of structure, um, the structural inequities. Right. Absolutely. And it always also strikes me it's my opinion. Um, I'm not an expert at all in the field, but it's just my opinion from my anecdotal experience is that um, public health used to confront industry and confront the government and corporations when they took actions that were imperiling people's health. Now, what I see and read and hear more frequently is invocations of personal responsibility, which is important we should all take responsibility for what we eat and what we drink and how we behave. That's true. But some ailments cannot be changed or corrected or impacted by personal responsibility. You know, um, infection in the pandemic is one of them. It's just not appropriate. And yet I still hear, you know, in these invocations not to smoke and drink, for example, um, invocations of a questionable high risk factor for obesity, I still hear, you know, this uh, sentiment that personal responsibility is the key when it's not, I don't think it is here. And uh, that makes me think that um, in our earlier conversations, uh, there, there has been a discussion about the problem of making comparisons to, uh, or in the mainstream of the problem of making comparisons to the um, 1918 um, pandemic and influenza and that like there's so much missing between that gap and uh, when you're thinking about this this blaming of public health on per personal responsibility that like what is missing is like we're listen we're living in uh, late stage capitalism and 
that that affects some of the, uh, the outsides in regards to that pandemic. So uh, in regards to how people are looking at this historically and the comparisons that are being made, uh, could you both share your thoughts on that? I'd love for you to go first. <laughs> I consider, consider you the expert in this. Samuel. Sorry about that, I was on mute. I was just saying thank you for that, that compliment, <laughs> Harry. And I also, from experience, know that I should probably speak before you because what you say will be the most brilliant aspect of it. So I should go ahead and say what I need to say in advance. <laughs> um, but um, in all seriousness, and really just quickly, I would say that we need to be, and similarly in how we do our narratives of interpretation of this, we also should be careful about how we do the historical comparisons as well. I know that the historians have rushed uh, to compare this to the last you know, major global pandemic, meaning the 1918 flu, which is probably appropriate for at least thinking about the history of pandemics, right? Um, certainly in thinking about you know, national quarantines and national policy and international cooperation. Um, that is not an inappropriate comparison. But at the level of social politics and social history of the disease, I think there might be other more appropriate comparisons. Um, because as you mentioned, Obden, we're in um, what scholars have variously called you know, late, late capitalism, um, post-Fordist capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. This, this kind of looks, it's, it's hitting some of the same contours as HIV uh, did after the 1990s. You know, for a long time, uh, not a long time, for a number of years, the 1980s, it was something that, you know, people associated strictly with gay men and intravenous drug users. And uh, I think by mid, the mid 1990s or so, we started to realize some of the structural contours along which HIV infection uh, traveled um, and whom it hit the most hard as well. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that here that we need to follow not just the virus, but follow the social structure that makes the virus so deadly. The United States really should not have the high level of morbidity and mortality that we have, except the way our social structure is and how that impacts public health and, um, and also medicine and healthcare. So I think there's, I don't think the 1918 pandemic is, a, is an inappropriate comparison, but for, but it's appropriate only for certain axes of comparison. For others, we need to think about more recent history where our, as you said, late capitalism has had its detrimental effects on public health. I think this is really just the most recent of, you know, a solid 40 or 50 years of examples. I couldn't agree more. I remember that when 1992, when I was at the School of Public Health, there was um, a lot of um, focus on the 1918-20 um, flu pandemic. And the common mantra was, we're overdue for the next pandemic. After that, I noticed that almost every infectious disease that came around, there were some people who immediately jumped the gun and began to making this comparison but it didn't hold. And it does hold in that when you have a global pandemic necessarily gonna have some features in common, every one. But yeah. you're right. I, I think that when it comes to a pandemic that is a parallel, a closer parallel to what we find ourselves facing today, not just medically, but also, also politically and socially, HIV is a much better parallel and also much fresher in our minds because we have the same elements here. We have, um, the fear engendered and xenophobia engendered by an infectious disease that we don't understand well. The reluctance of some, a minority, thank goodness, of some healthcare providers to actually administer care to them, a curtailing of human rights, demonization of the infected. We have a um, situation where we've got these um, marginalized groups who are being, you know, focused upon. I remember in 95, when I saw the first report, I think it was 95, documenting that it, the HIV epicenter was the American South and the African Americans were more hardly hit. This was shocking to me because everything I had been reading was focusing on Manhattanites and mm -hmm. gay men. 
So it's not that there wasn't evidence that the um, of the vulnerability of African Americans in other parts of the country. We weren't. We just weren't paying attention. Just like with this one, with the coronavirus 19, we were looking the other way when it struck, you know, and not looking at the people who turned out to be the most vulnerable to it. So there are a lot of parallels, a lot of lessons we should have learned then that I hope that we will now learn. And um, just one thing as an aside, I, I probably should not get too deeply into this now, but one of the things I think that a lot of us are feeling is the um, this menace caused by the fact that we have a lot of violence, racial violence, um, at the same time as we're dealing with this pandemic. And I think that's no accident. I mean, there are a lot of studies showing that people become more xenophobic in times of infection. And I think that that's part of what we're seeing here because we have to remember that um, now the focus is on the ever present but escalating problem of violence against African Americans, but this began with violence against Asian Americans. At one point, 100 Asian Americans a day were being attacked by others uh, who would often shout at them that they had, it was, this was their virus that they had brought us here, blaming them in some way. So um, anyway, there's a lot to worry about here, unfortunately, and it's imperative that we learn our lessons a little better this time. And Harry, I'm glad that you brought up the, um, the uh the HIV comparison in the South in the mid 1990s, because if you look at the history of COVID-19, in terms of if you, you know, if you look at maps in the United States and at different time periods, it's around, I think July-ish, August, maybe early August, like basically the month of July, when the South really started to get hit Love hard. It. And that map, like a time series map, looks like of a sped up version of HIV in the United States from like 1981 to 2000. When in the in 1980s, we were largely, as you said, thinking about New York City and the right. Bay Area. And then by 1995, it's like, oh my God, this thing is in the South. And I was like, well, you know, we now know because of the structural inequalities there, uh, you know, just the kind of the, the neoliberal economies and politics have been doing to communities, black and white, in the South, and then we just, this was almost a rapid, like a sped up version, you know, back when we used to have records, like a 78 RPM versus a 33 and a third <laughs> RPM. Right. That's a throwback to anybody my age or older, I guess, in the audience. I def um, definitely old enough to get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, again, like, so the HIV, you know, comparison, you would have thought we would have used that to see this coming, but I guess we didn't, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Sorry, I was just tagging on to what Harry nope. said before that. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's the that, end of that's my comment. Yeah. That was really important. <laughs> yeah, and um, I I appreciate that um, that you mentioned that like we weren't paying attention that there are multiple truths that um, looking at the data in regards to the South with what was happening with AIDS and um, you know that we should have realized the same thing at this time period. And um, some of the things that you mentioned in regards to like the xenophobia that came around with this pandemic reminds me of the interview that I had with Frank Wu, who is the president of Queens College. And um, he like talking about his experience uh, as an Asian American and the, the internal belief that um, Asian Americans are, are foreigners, whether or not, and that um, in regards to African Americans, that um, it, it reminds me of the term that you said earlier, Dr. Roberts, in regards to like being disembodied and almost being like uh, removed from a society that like we built or that um, is like kind of based on our existence and also based on um, the violence that happens against us. So um, I think the, the next question that I wanted to, to get into is that um, we have slightly discussed like this issue uh, of scapegoating. And um, we did talk about this uh, example of the 1918 pandemic, uh, but other things that I've been hearing is that the reason that um, African-Americans have been skeptical, skeptical of, about testing is the Tuskegee experiments. And uh, <laughs> uh, I know, I know um, Harriet, that 
Um, from, from Harriet's I, chuckle, you know okay. I'm going to hear one. I'm gonna, you're going first on this one. I need to, I need to hear this. <laughs> yes, I'm loaded for bear. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, the most polite way I can find of putting this is that Tuskegee is an overburdened icon. It's a go-to, mm. and quite frankly, it's lazy. It's one of the few studies that most people know about. And it has become, unfortunately, this perennial go-to whenever there's a complaint or a, something emerging about abusing African-Americans, especially in a research setting. But it's not. You know, Tuskegee um, was one chapter in my book, Medical Apartheid. The fact is there was no sphere of American medicine in which African-Americans were not abused. And most of the research that I write about in Medical Apartheid, most of the major studies that I dwell on are, were much worse than Tuskegee. At the same time in Tuskegee, for, for example, you had African-Americans being killed outright in malaria experimentations in which they were given malaria intentionally. So the focus on Tuskegee is simply intellectually lazy. It's not a good parallel. And the reason why I, I won't say rant, the reason why I complain about this so much is that this um, focus on Tuskegee gives rise to a very unfortunate phenomenon. If you only focus on Tuskegee, then basically you're saying that African-American um, wariness around medical research is an overreaction to one study. That's not what's happened. What African-Americans have a logical fear and resistance to medical treatment and research because of a centuries long history of many, many exploitive and fatal and harmful um, research studies, not a, one simple study. So we need to stop doing this, frankly. We need to find, believe me, so much has been done to us as a people in the medical sphere that is, that is unconscionable and frankly fatal and dangerous that we will not have a hard time finding a parallel that's really appropriate and accurate to anything that happens to us. And so we need, people need to learn the history better so they can come up with better examples. And that's my piece. I literally have nothing to add to that. I, <laughs> besides <laughs> what she said, yeah, absolutely. I'm a thousand percent in agreement. Um, mm -hmm. It's been very frustrating to see, not just in the context of COVID-19, but almost any time when we discuss um, medical mistrust amongst um, communities of color, it'll be Tuskegee. And, it's, yeah, and, and, and as you just said, Harry, it, at a certain point, that narrative quickly becomes one of, oh, they, I guess they just can't let it go. Right, um, exactly. You know, that was, that was almost 50 years ago was when that ended, you know, began, you know, 80 years ago. What, what's the problem? You know, it's like, well, the problem is the stuff that's happening right now. Um, <laughs> right. You know, everything would be fine if it was only Tuskegee. I mean, but that's, that's not the case. I wouldn't, not fine, you get what I'm saying. Of but um, it's a continuing uh, uh, history of medical uh, practices against Black communities and really communities of color and poor communities as well. So yeah, uh, I, a thousand percent. Yeah. Yes, and um, both of you saying that makes me think of um, the the issue of just like how endemic racial thought is um, in regards to medical practice, where uh, as I mentioned earlier, with Asian Americans, they are considered like there is this xenophobia that started during the pandemic. And in regards to the black body, it is considered just foreign. So um, uh, there have been studies that have said that um, doc doctors usually do in more often than not believe that black, uh, black patients experience more pain. I'm sorry, ex experience less pain than others. Uh, which for me is like kind of very personal because I, I am someone that um, has sickle cell anemia and um, going to hospitals is always like a difficult experience and like basically expressing um, what I'm going through. And um, I guess what I'm thinking about is this issue of uh, erasure of like the black experience within the medical series experience and how it's kind of like crystallized into this one moment. Um, and um, in regards to this uh, pandemic, are there other examples that um, help elucidate that the problems that we're going through now? There's a lot of examples, <laughs> the, the unfortunate part. Um, back, just, just um, 
I guess really just to take up a small point of that question about the pain, I would remind our viewers um, that part of a, an ideology of white supremacy, or just even just the cultural zeitgeist, you know, we, we don't even talk about it as a formal ideology, is that to allow injustice to happen and also to believe in justice, that, that's gonna create a cognitive dissonance. And it's resolved by a belief that, well, they just don't feel pain as much as we do, we meaning white people. Um, and then everything can resolve itself. Whatever pangs of guilt you may have will be resolved if you think it actually doesn't hurt the other person. And that's what we've had, I mean, really, since our, you know, our entire existence in this country, that's been the case. So I'll say that, and I would say it happens, um, you say in examples, I mean, everywhere, right? I mean, people typically think of like the movement for black lives as being literally, we should be able to live. But I would argue that, you know, along with that is that, you know, we should be able to do a lot of things that a lot of other Americans are able to do as we live our lives. Um, Jacob Blake, as far as I can remember, is the first person in a long time for whom we've had major protest who was not murdered. Right. Which is really kind of messed up when you think about it. You know, he was gravely injured. And when you think about how many other people, you know, probably have been, and we never, you know, people who have been killed and we never heard about them, but then we've never heard about anybody who was gravely injured by police violence. And we, we you have to assume it happens a lot. Um, and so we have to really interrogate that at its, at its deepest levels. Yes, and um, it's absolutely so. And I also want to add that when you say someone is incented to pain, you're saying something important about them beyond their physical phenomenon. Basically what you're saying, you're questioning that person's humanity. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I, I realized that when I was reading a defense of abortion that focused on research showing that a fetus supposedly did not feel pain. And I thought, at first, I thought, well, that's a, just a practical um, point they're trying to make that you, that's one thing you don't have to worry about in terms, ethically in terms of abortion. Then I realized something else. I said, no, this is basically an argument against the fetus actually being human. No matter where you stand on that, it's really clear that invoking the absence of pain says something about invoking the uh, lack of sensitivity a person might have. Or, and it's really important to understand the history behind that. I think I often talk about the American School of Ethnology. In the 19th century, the premier doctors and scientists in this country banded together to tell the world who African Americans were. Not only did we not feel pain as whites did, we were less intelligent. We had a very bestial animalistic um, sexual drive that we could not control. We had diseases that nobody else got. We had immunities disease that other people didn't have. We didn't die from yellow fever, for example, or we didn't die as often from malaria. Um, so there are all these beliefs about African-American bodies and psyches that set us apart. These scientists, for the most part, did not believe that African-Americans were truly human. They thought we occupied a different species from Homo sapiens. And so um, all of this taken together you know, was a scientific, um, the validated belief that African Americans were less than human. And it's very frightening that today, or very recently, we still have research showing that doctors believe parts of this. 2016 University of Virginia study showed that half of all medical students believe that black people didn't feel pain as whites do. And a good proportion of practicing doctors believe this as well. But African Amer but they also believe that African Americans didn't um, respond to radiology like whites did and needed higher doses of radiation. The frightening thing about that is you'd be hard pressed to find a radiology textbook that said, give African Americans a 25% higher dose. But yet students were learning this. They were learning it as part of their training, a tacit part of their practice, not written down, but um, gained by watching doctors how they treated patients. So we haven't gotten shut of all these beliefs about African-Americans, different bodies and inferiority. And um, the fact that they persist today is very frightening. I mean, there, we have to find ways today to stop training medical students to believe these horrible things about African-American bodies.
is that back to me or I'm just because <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I'm just chewing on that right now I'm still, I'm still you know, that was a lot yeah. to think about yeah no um, I, have, I have no further comment besides you, <laughs> I don't know if you all I don't know how this comes out in the uh, the zoom uh, broadcast but you probably heard me saying that almost an amen under my breath <laughs> you know, period speech so I hope that's not distracting um, that's just my call and response there oh far from it thank you yeah. Oh, I mean, um, like moving forward in this conversation, um, it, it sounds like uh, there needs, one of the things when I think about um, the, the practice of medicine is that um, there seems to be a singular focus. And I know Dr. Roberts, that in your podcast, there has been conversations about um, this, this practice of um, social medicine, like uh, I know that in one podcast, it was a discussion with the Black Panthers and how they understood that uh, there needed to be a holistic approach. And that is something we've been discussing for most of this time that like, uh, it's not only just a body that needs to be treated, but like um, there is uh, the economics, um, education, uh, housing, and all of these things go into uh, the basically like the physical well-being of people of color and, um, and Black people. Um, so I think uh, what, one of the things I'm thinking about is like, does there, are there things that need to be changed within the medical practice so that there is a um, understanding of the cultural biases that are included um, when doctors start working in the field? Doctors and yeah. Um, yeah. everyone within that practice. Like uh, I know that there's an issue of like only thinking about doctors and nurses during this pandemic and that there are multiple health workers um, that have been on the front lines. Yeah, that interview, by the way, was with my good friend and colleague, Alondra Nelson, um, yes. who's now president of the SSRC. Um, and her book is titled Body and Soul. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry that I'm forgetting the subtitle or the, the part after the colon, but it's about the uh, Black Panther parties. Uh, medical practices and their their movement for medical justice and medical civil rights. It's a brilliant book. I've taught it many times in classes, and I highly recommend it to our listeners. In terms of, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, medical training, I'm going to leave this one to Harriet because she speaks uh, at at far more medical schools and grand rounds than I do. I'll just say that a distinction should be made uh, with our viewers between medicine and public health. Um, in good practices, the both can be, you know, almost seamlessly integrated. But quite often, particularly in this country, that is not the case. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Ernie Drucker, who's an epidemiologist, uh, uses the metaphor that medicine deals with the cow and public health deals with the herd meaning mm -hmm. medicine treats individual patients and you're trying to fix what's wrong with this one person. Public health says, whoa, we have a spike in a whole lot of people in this one condition over a short period, what's behind that? And so ideally what good public health will do, will find out what's the social, um, social system, the social structures, which have produced fluctuations in various health conditions. But that is the extent of any expertise I will claim um, and I will gladly hand that one off to Harriet. Well, I love that analogy, by, by the way. <laughs> it is um, not my Ernie Drucker told me Please tell him. Ago. Yeah, he's brilliant. I've cited him in my books and tell him I love it anyway. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research and a lot of talk around um, biases, um, which it's certainly accurate, but I always like to think of them rather as mythologies. I don't know why, maybe because I was trained in literature originally, but these are myths. You know, they're not things that are true, and yet they're deeply felt, they're relieved, and they, of course, inflect the way doctors practice medicine. So a lot, you know, there's a lot of talk about implicit biases, cultural biases, all of which are real, but we tend not to talk about explicit bias. And that's when a physician um, very consciously treats people of color or anyone differently than he does the standard, you know, um, respected white male patient. So explicit biases exist too. 
And it's important to realize that. I mean, if you work in a hospital in any capacity, you will see it. It's something that's there. It's ugly, but it's there. And we have to address that as well. But either way, I think, you know, one of the, there's a lot of um, discussion of it. There are a lot of theories about what can be done. There are a lot of smaller projects that probably that do bear fruit, but they're limited. And frankly, I feel it's like throwing a can of soda on a burning building. You know, we need to do something powerful and we need something sweeping. And some of the things that I've um, thought about um, as worthy of being, you know, considered and entertained are things like we know that people at the helm of organizations set the agenda. If you, when I was at the University of Chicago um, giving lectures, the director of medicine made health um, healthcare disparities his focus. Everybody then made healthcare disparities their focus. And that's really important. That should be a criterion by which hospitals and medical centers choose their leaders. And I think too that there should be, just as in surgery, People have instituted using checklists that are very efficient in terms of, um, they recognize a problem in that sometimes procedures were not carried out correctly because of the many, many factors, you know, time constraints, pressures. Um, it's extraordinary what they have to deal with. And they had the idea of using um, checklists to make sure every step was taken. We need to do something like that. I think we need to um, have criteria set in writing um, according to which people's progress will be graded. And that grading should be more than a sort of um, pride or shame. It should actually dictate how the clinicians are treated. So a physician who's a resident should not be able to advance in his residency unless he has pr documented proof that he is um, avoiding bias and he's treating people equit equitably. And people's um, advancement academically um, their ability to, to hold their jobs, even their pay should be tied to meeting these um, benchmarks. I got the idea when I was um, writing about infectious disease for my book, Infectious Madness, and I found out that hand washing was sometimes an issue with surgeons not doing appropriate hand washing and hospitals were appointing nurses to remind them, you can imagine how well that went over, right? But one hospital had the idea of doing that having a nurse remind the surgeons and keep track of hand washing, but also to tie surgeons pay to whether they met the standards. And they found that immediately the hand washing compliance skyrocketed, everyone did it. So I think we need to consider benchmarks, real rewards, real benefits, you know, and to institute these things. And basically this will affect cl clinical people where they live, essentially, and I think it, I think it'll, I hope it will impart greater immediacy to them because immediacy is what we need. This has been going on for a very long time; it has not appreciably improved, and we need to consider um, more powerful steps. You know, it struck me, Harriet, as you were speaking. There was almost a point where I got confused whether or not we were speaking of COVID-19 or the uh, current, um, all the issues against which we've been protesting in the movement for black lives. They're that seamlessly overlapped and imbricated with each other. Everything you just said applies to that too, right? I mean, we have this moment where everybody, you know, our state, our, the, you know, the, the governments of our states, not really the federal government um, and cities, corporations, are part of this, what's been called a racial reckoning. And everyone's falling over themselves to do things. But uh, like you were saying, we need to ask the question, are they putting their money where their mouth is? Like, are they right. making deep change? Or are they making symbolic change? And I think that's all the difference in the world. Like you said, if, if a medical school, if their president is, is putting real effort and real money and resources behind dealing with health inequities, then we know that's probably going in the right direction. But if they're just kind of doing symbolism, maybe renaming a building or doing whatever, then that could just be business as usual with just some different symbols. Okay. Yeah. I muted myself. <clears throat> and uh, we, have, uh, we have about nine minutes left and I, I have about two questions that I want to get through before we go into the QA. 
Um, the first being that uh, uh, both being uh, historians in, in, in your rights, um, in your own rights, what I wanted to know about is what are your concerns in regards to how the mainstream narrative is going to be told um, 20 years from the future in regards to this pandemic? I've had a hard time trying to think 20 weeks into the future these days. I don't, I don't know about you so all, true. 20 years from now, I don't know what's the world's gonna look like. I mean, um, yeah, 20, I mean, I, I, I use 20 years just because usually that's the statute of limitation to like reflect on, um, on an event, but you're right. So. Yeah, I don't know, in COVID time, like 20 months might be where <laughs> we're thinking. Um, I mean, it's a great question. I don't know, I think certainly this year will be remembered in no, like no other year, you know, since 1968, because of not just the virus, but for the, the global protests and just everything. This has been a, a pretty interesting year to use a, a euphemism, I guess. Um, I guess I'm not, I, I am concerned a bit about how we'll remember this in 20 years from now, but I think that concern is mitigated by the fact that I myself am still trying to interpret it as I'm living through it. So I don't really have a prescription for how we should remember it. I think I might be more concerned about how our recovery, our remembering of our history is impacting how we're doing our work in the present. And I think, you know, for the prime example, going back to the racial reckoning of 2020, um, you know, there's been a lot of invocations of you know, the March on Washington, obviously, with the passing of John Lewis um, and the anniversary of the march last month. Um, we've been thinking a lot about the civil rights movement and this moment being, you know, hearkening back to the 1960s. But along with it, I think we've jettisoned a lot of the message of that movement. You know, forgetting that the March on Washington was for was the march for jobs and freedom. It, there was an economic message in there, not just, you know, a movement to be able to sit at a lunch counter. Like, you know, the organizers were very clear about this, that it was an economic uh, movement as much as it was a political and social one. I think um, we have to be very careful about how we unpackage our history because sometimes it's been packaged for us in ways that are palatable for, you know, you know kind of our corporate elites, our ruling elites, um, our educational elites and universities, institutions. We have to be very critical about how we think about that. So that's more my concern. I can't think 20 years in the future, I mean, I'm doing day by day at this point. So yeah, excellent question. Mm. That is a wonderful question. And I'll be my usual ray of sunshine <laughs> by saying, I hope we're here 20 years in the future, the way things are going. But I'm going to assume that we will be and we will have learned something, but it's important to understand something. And that is that the things that we are faced with today that we're surrounded by conflagration and it's not an act of God. It may look that way, but the West Coast is on fire due to climate change, which has been denied by people at the top in our government. And um, xenophobia has risen to the point where we are having the, the, the armed battle in the streets. And I remember that white supremacists used to um, fantasize about. I used to almost laugh at that, you know, Actually, they've, they've come about, and they've come about partly because we have a leader who thinks it's appropriate to refer to some countries as shithole countries and refer to a pandemic as a China flu. These, things, these flames are being fanned by people's actions, and we have um, African-American, Hispanic, Native American, hardworking people who, whenever I hear, hear the term essential workers, I now hear sacrificial workers. Instead of these people being um, protected and given the greater care and frankly, the apology that they are due, they're being blamed for their own disease. These things are not things that have been wrought on us by nature or by um, you know, disease. Infectious disease, of course, is very capricious. We can't control them, but we can control how we react to them. And our reaction to them has made things so much worse than they need to be. You know. It's 
our collective behavior, and by that I mean, frankly, the behavior of our government, our administration, the people in power, the public health officials who are kowtowing to people in power, they have made this so much worse than it needs to be. I hope that 20 years from now we look back and we understand that and we are ashamed, but that would be predicated on our now facing this fact and determining to do something about it. Basically, I'm saying that to a certain extent, these are self-inflicted wounds and we can do better. Okay. Um, and then uh, we, we just have about three minutes left. And um, recently I've seen that there has been um, this, this fervor to, to gain, um, get this vaccine by the end of November or whenever it's planned to be coming out, but like, it seems that we are closer to it. But um, in regards to not if we'll have a vaccine, but what are your concerns in regards to its distrib distribution? Um, I'm gonna be brief. I have not forgotten that in April, two French doctors announced to the world that these trials, initial trials should be conducted in Africa because they had prostitutes there who would make good subjects and the people there had no health care anyway and would grasp at straws. That mentality is very problematic. And um, when I hear the words Operation Warp Speed, I understand both that we do need this to be done speedily, but we need it to be done safely and effectively. And it's very, very important to be um, careful about ensuring these things as best is possible. So that's all I have to say that I haven't said already. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I, I share those concerns uh, along with, I, I don't trust this government to have a good plan for distribution. We certainly haven't had a good plan for tests. Testing, the, the kind of testing that we need is not just for diagnostic purposes, which is to say, again, cow versus herd, you know, we need to diagnose individual people who think they may have it, but we also need surveillance testing to see what's the prevalence of this thing in any given, you know, neighborhood or city or state or region. And we don't have that yet, largely because we don't have distribution. We have reports over the summer, hopefully this has changed a bit, but you know, people paying upwards of $6,000 to get a test when in good public health, this should be really free, right? Because in public health, we need as many tests as possible, um, particularly among people that we don't suspect of having it, just so we get a good sense of the prevalence. We can't wait till people are clearly infected to then decide to use a test to confirm that. We need it for surveillance measures so we can gauge what's going on. And we haven't done that. So I'm that would be the same infrastructure I assume that we would be using to distribute a vaccine. And if we haven't distributed the test well, I'm not sure what's to say that we would do a much better job at distributing a vaccine. It is different, um, but I'm not sure how much different that, that we should be optimistic about it. Okay. Um, and by the way, what I said about the 6,000, that was from the New York Times um, it was a woman and her husband who had no health insurance. So those of us with insurance, you know, you might pay a copay or, or get it for free even. But if you're not insured, the test in most locations is not free, or at least it has not been. You will pay money for it, particularly if you need to have surgery. So that gets bundled in to your, your, the, your cost of your other health care. If you have any sort of surgery, elective or unelected, you're going to get a COVID test first. And that will be part of the bill. All right. Well, um, right now I'd like to take out the time to thank you, thank Harriet A. Washington and Dr. Sammy K. Roberts for um, your wonderful intellect and insight on this topic. And um, yeah, and that it was just very wonderful to have this conversation and that now we're going to go into the Q and A. I will also take out the time to remind uh, the audience to please provide any questions that you have um, for these two, and we will try to answer it live. And I guess now I'll go into uh, some of the questions that have already been provided. Um, the first one being, 
what are your thoughts on maternal mort mortality layered with the pandemic? And why are birth centers still so rare? Actually, that's <clears throat> the, the intersection of maternal health and COVID-19. I think from what, and this is not, and I don't know about you, Harriet, um, I don't have much expertise in that. I do know that before, like with a lot of things before COVID-19, that was something that there had been, um, that we were paying more attention to. I know um, for, um, uh, for example, Linda Villarosa has been uh, writing about this for the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, Donna Ann Davis published a really good book on the topic. She's an anthropologist. Um, and many others have been looking more at birthing justice and those issues, how it overlaps with COVID-19. I'm just, I might have a, a better than average knowledge. So I, I'm not gonna claim any expertise at all on that. I haven't seen data about how uh, maternal mortality rates overlap with COVID-19. So I can't speak to that. I'm not even certain that um, that is being collected on that. Uh, certainly it should be, but I, I don't know. I would, if I were to speculate, I would say this is yet one more, um, um, one more factor contributing to the unacceptably high rate of maternal um, morbidity and mortality and also infant mortality. I remember that very late in the Flint crisis, a report was published, and I think it was published by health economists, showing that there were many, many fetuses who had died in utero as a result of the tainted water of Flint. And this was published um, late in the um, late in the game. So I, I, that made me concerned both that I wondered how much attention was being paid to this. Um, and whether it's something that people are monitoring as they should. And your question actually reinforces that, that feeling or that, that concern. I hope somebody is paying attention to this. Yeah, I, I think there's something, about, um, so there's something about this pandemic that is just so almost ungraspable because of the so, so many facets that it impacts. It's, um, in a lot of ways, it's been a stress test for our entire system. Things that we've been ignoring and kind of putting off, you know, kicking the can down the road, putting off for later, now are even more urgent. And, and I'm not saying that the problems with African-American maternal health and infant health were not urgent 12 months ago. They absolutely were. And this just makes it even more so. And there's just, I mean, there's so, housing is now, we're, we're finally paying attention to issues with you know, the housing crisis, which wasn't resolved by the resolution of the economic crisis that was started by the housing bubble. We still have a housing crisis and COVID-19 is a stress test for that as well. Um, it's a stress test for our political system, obviously, as our other individuals too, so, yeah. Yeah, um, but uh, to, to, to harp on, on that point that you mentioned that this is a stress test, uh, within some of the oral histories I've collected, um, one of the one of the issues that does come up is housing, um, and there are some people who are blessed or lucky enough or privileged enough to either just have a house that they can stay in. Um, some people had roommates that like disappeared. Other experiences that I collected um, is uh, in my introduction um, at Queens College. I am also collecting oral histories on um, students that attend that are part of SEEK and also. Uh, instructors and counselors. And some of the stories that I heard from them, um, because SEEK is to help those that are um, that are lower income, is that you have some students who are trying to uh, attend Queens College, but they are with uh, four or four to six, like several people in the house and they're supposed to go to class, also take care of um, people in the house while they're attending school and like deal with the people that have the virus. Um, there has also been um, one instance where someone had died in the house and they had to wait a few days before it could be removed. So um, it is very much a stress test um, 
in regards to societal aspects. And um, uh, yeah, I, I do think about that a lot. Um, and, um, you know, housing just being an issue that if you are living with a lot of people, then you are more likely to um, contract the virus. And uh, there are some people who like were able to just leave. Um, but I'm going to go into the next question where, um, uh, since I was talking about students, um, a question that we do have is, do you think students and teachers should be returning to school? And when do you think it would be safe or what would make it safer? So I'll reiterate the first part. Uh, do you think students and teachers should be returning to school? No, <laughs> I don't. Um, I think that it's unfortunate that some of the argument for students returning to school is invoking the lower rate of disease found in students and the idea that students have suffer a milder form of disease. And in a way that's not really pertinent because the students are living in homes with other people. Sometimes they're living with grandparents who are at the highest uh, age, you know, in the highest risk age group. And if not, they're living with their parents who are vulnerable. And um, it just seemed to me that there are, it's a complex problem, of course. There are a lot of um, difficulties with retaining students at home but sending them to school where they're um, more likely to have come in contact with kids who are infected or teachers who are adults just seems almost perverse. Um, the question is, what are the other options? You know, the other options are not, not good options for people who are not wealthy. Um, so it's problematic, but sending them back to school just does not seem, it seems, um, uh, intentionally, it seemed like a bad idea, frankly. Yeah, I would say just, uh, I think that's again, the COVID-19 has been a stress test on our educational system. You know, we sent all these kids home, rightfully so, but then that was the moment when we realized, or not realized, when we were reminded of the digital divide. So, yeah. you know, everyone said, okay, we're gonna do remote, you know, distance learning, you know, problem solved, oh, hold on a second. We have a large proportion of Americans who don't have any or at least adequate internet provision. How do we, let alone the equipment to pursue an education remotely. So I, um, you know, we're stuck, right? I mean, I don't think in many cases we should be sending people back. I, I think certainly the teachers unions, um, particularly here in, in, in New York where I am, have been very vocal about that they wanna see certain benchmarks met before they return to school. And I think it's been the same in other parts of the country, um, but we're caught between that and children not being educated at home. So, I mean, it's it's not even a catch 22. It's just, it's just two bad decisions. Well, I guess that's the definition of a catch 22, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess for me, I also agree that school is, this is a very difficult and terrible issue where like anyone that doesn't really have um, money can deal with it. And um, some of it reminds, like makes me think of the logic of, of capitalism where um, there is this need to immediately return back to normal and there is yet to be the acceptance that it's going to take some time. Um, or to take the proper protocols to allow people to like acclimate to this moment until we realize what's going to happen. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop with my comment there. Uh, and the next question is, um, I'll, I'll read it in its entirety just because the person took out the time to write all of it. And uh, it's directed towards Dr. Washington, but I think uh, we can all speak on this. Um, so it says, Dr. Washington, it's an honor, although virtually, to address you. Uh, I have been using your work with my science students in biology and bioethics for some years, from a medical apartheid, deadly mo monopolies, and currently a terrible thing to waste. I am currently planning a unit project exploring the environmental injustices, injustices that contributed to the pre-existing conditions making Black and Latinos more susceptible to COVID-19. 
Can you elaborate on specific environmental abuses that have affected us disproportionately? Also, what are some of the arguments to convince our community to become involved in vaccine trials with the legitimate fears from the past and present uh, abuses in medical research? So I'll read the first part uh, of the question again. Can you elaborate on the specific environmental abuses that have been affected, that have affected us disproportionately and um, us being Blacks and Latinos? First of all, thank you for your kind words about my work and I will do my best <laughs> to address your question. In terms of environmental racism, how is it contributing to coronavirus 19? Almost every aspect of environmental racism poses a risk factor for coronavirus 19. Um, in terms of lead exposure, lead increases vulnerability to, to most types of infection and coronavi coronavirus 19 is no exception. So exposure to lead and by implication, some other heavy metals like mercury and arsenic actually increase your vulnerability. Diseases like diabetes um, and deficiency of vitamin D and vitamin C also increase your vulnerability. And they are also caused by environmental racism in that people um, who live in food deserts, which I like to call food swamps, because they not only are areas where you can't find affordable, nutritious food, but there's a plethora of very potent forms of tobacco and alcohol. So the poor nutrition leads to vitamin deficiency, another risk factor for coronavirus 19. Immunocompromise is a risk factor. We think often of um, HIV infection when we think of immunocompromise, but it's also caused by cancer treatment. And we know that exposure to many chemicals, everything from the PCBs to phthalates um, implicated in environmental racism cause cancers. Treating those cancers gives rise to immunocompromise, another risk factor, coronavirus 19. Um, and frankly, there are more, but you get the idea. And environmental racism is only one of the inequities that African-Americans face. I think you could probably find a lot of um, others that, that uh, affect us and also point to direct correlation between the damage done to our bodies by them and coronavirus 19 infection. So great question. In terms of vaccine trials, um, frankly, there are so many things involved that it's hard to point to just some of the errors. But I would I already mentioned the fact that the French doctors who said that we should be conducting these early trials, which were um, placebo trials, which are falling out of favor in the West because they're unethical in some cases. We should do them in Africa because people there have little choice. They have no health care anyway. And that is exactly what has happened repeatedly. Um, when Pfizer went to Kano, Nigeria, at the height of a meningitis epidemic, they brought their experimental antibiotic and ended up with dead children, children who had um, defects like loss of hearing. And they were sued. They settled out of court, huge settlement. And um, in the aftermath, you had doctors who were admitting that they had forged consent forms. Doctors who admit, admitted that they wrote up agreements and were required by law after the experiment had already ended. Many of the people did not know they were getting an experimental treatment because the tents had been set up right next to the Doctors Without Borders tents where they were giving people standard treatment. So anyway, that is the kind of thing that happened in the developing world. They're governed by US laws in part and by the Declaration of Helsinki, but nobody's monitoring them. So. When African Americans learn of these things and much, much worse things that are done to people in the developing world, it's not irrational for them to wonder whether they're going to be treated um, similarly. Also, we have only lo look at the history of, of um, vaccine trials in this country to see there have been a lot of problems. In 1995, Black and Hispanic parents were not told that the um, vaccine given BCD vaccine given their children was experimental. They thought it was a standard vaccine. This kind of thing has happened frequently. And so to ask African-Americans to trust the system is problematic because when these things have happened, there have not been an apology, but more to the point, there has not been a system set in motion to offer people any reassurance that, that things are going to change. 
You know, no one has said we're changing the law to make sure it doesn't happen again. We're going to increase oversight. So African-American resistance and fear is rational. It's logical. Now, you know, the problem too is that, last thing I'm going to say is that we always discuss African-American fears, but we need to discuss them in the context of an untrustworthy U.S. healthcare system. You have, to, you have to talk about both. Otherwise, it's a subtle form of blaming the victim. We can't blame African-Americans. We have to blame the healthcare system. That's what needs to be fixed before we can ask people to trust it. As that question was directed mainly towards Harriet, I'm just gonna, as I've said at least a few times this discussion, I agree a thousand percent. Would also add, um, uh, she mentioned the Declaration of Helsinki just for those uh, who might, those in the audience who might not have caught that, it's the Declaration of Helsinki. I believe it's the mid 1960s, right, Harriet? Right. right World, yeah. World Medical Association. Right. Yeah. Governing or setting setting standards for um, ethical human um, subjects research. Also, I, I also remembered um, there was a question about maternal health a few questions back um, that somebody asked. Uh, information on that might be found on a really uh, good website called rewire.news which is a, a news outlet which specializes particularly in um, women's health politics. And um, yeah, so that if there's any uh, coverage of overlap between COVID-19 and maternal health might be covered there as well. And I've, I follow them on Twitter. They have really good coverage. Open your I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm muted. Uh, I was doing so good up until this point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have two um, questions that kind of are interconnected. And um, the first one I want to, to look at is, uh, is this one, which is the official discourse of on personal responsibility is dominant in most European countries as well. Thus, masking the failure of the government to strengthen the public health system. Um, can OH, which I want to think is oral history documentation, or can OH document how people react to that? Do some people buy this argument? So um, I guess the question is, do some people buy this argument of personal responsibility? Um, and can oral history document that? I mean, I mean, I, I think it's clear that a lot of people do buy into that. And we have to keep in mind, too, that, um, you know, a term that we use a lot, um, you know, in our critical discussions, neoliberalism, in, in its formal definition, um, what other scholars have called responsibiliz responsibilization um, is part and parcel of that, um, which is to say that if neoliberalism at its elemental implies or requires a, uh, 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 oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm becoming inarticulate here, a downscaling or reduction of social services, particularly from the federal government, which then redounds down to the state and then leaving the city government usually holding the bag for everything, um, you know, such as ending welfare as we know it under Bill Clinton um, or Ronald Reagan's promises to, you know, get rid of welfare cheats, et cetera, et cetera. The backside of that, which is also part of what um, uh, sociologists such as uh, Lois uh, Laquant have called the Janus face of the social uh, welfare system or the welfare state, <clears throat> which is to say you make people you make people responsible for their own health, things that the state used to do in public health. Now all of us have to do it on our own, and we're made morally and ethically responsible for that. And the backs the Janus face part of that is something we haven't really discussed in this conversation, but I think as part of it, um, the uh, the carceral state, mm, right? We're, yes. we're at a period too where, you know, increasingly, you know, like so-called quality of life crimes are also, you know, really things that people do to survive, right? Um, people who are living rough on the street, you know, have found themselves pulled in a dragnet since the 1980s and 1990s. Um, you know, petty, you know, thefts or whatever, property crimes. All of that, you know, is part of the withdrawal of, of the social service, you know, safety net. So responsabilization is 
intimately tied to our carceral state. Don't ever think otherwise. And responsabilization itself isn't just about COVID-19. This is actually a political program um, that because it's so deep and so insidious and not part of any, you know, we live in a two party system. So it's kind of very mannequin in that sense, but both parties readily embraced that and so many other neoliberal uh, programs since the 1970s. That it's, it's now part of the air that we breathe and the, you know, the, the water that you know, the proverbial fish swims. And so, yeah, I think a lot of us have bought into it. It's almost hard not to, you know? I mean, I think we all kind of do, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I wear a Fitbit, you know? I, somehow I feel more <laughs> responsible for my health when I make my steps, you know? Yeah. But like, what does that really mean? You know, like I could, you know, like, am I really taking care of myself by that? Or is this just something that, this is like a safety blanket I wear around my wrist to assure myself that I'm being responsible, but who knows? Or what that responsibility actually brings by assuming it too. I agree with you a thousand percent <laughs> that it's really, I mean, it's really important. You know, one aspect of the carceral state that I find especially heinous is treatment of children, children of color. Um, the book Push Out, it focuses on girls, but applies to boys as well. The normal behaviors of children or behaviors of children that are um, affected by the actions of adults around them are increasingly being um, demonized and you know, criminalized. Why are children being taken to jail for getting in fist fights? Why was a young African-American girl, why did she end up in jail after her mm. chemistry experiment went awry? An experiment that she conducted properly under the eyes of her teachers. Why are children being um, singled out and demonized and incarcerated for behaviors that are not criminal, are far from criminal, very young children. The thing that I think one reason why this horrifies me so much is the indifference of so many people who I had thought to be normal people <laughs> toward this. Um, the fact that the lack of outrage, um, I'm really concerned by that. I remember when I worked in a hospital I worked in a hospital for 13 years running, and I only got written up to personnel one time. That was because a 10-year-old boy was taken out of the emergency department in handcuffs. And I saw it, and I just had this visceral reaction. He was crying. He was a very slight boy. He looked like he was 10 years old or younger. And he was being let out in handcuffs. And I found out later that he was a runaway from a group home and who had somehow made his way to the hospital where he asked for help. And he was taken back in hand. Anyway, it's a kind of thing that um, I just would think would generate horror. And I find these news accounts that are coming very frequently about kids being put, you know, led to jail for normal behavior are not generating the outrage that they should, so. Yeah, I mean, um, there, there are some things I, I I think about. Well, first, in regards to like personal responsibility, um, sadly, the first thing that I think about is one of my favorite shows of all time is The Nick, uh, which was a I show on that. Cinemax. <laughs> okay, I love yes. that. <laughs> um, if, if you know me for more than 15 minutes, at one point, I'm going to mention it. Um, and like, look at, here we are now. We got to uh, talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, the so hold on. Show. Am I the only person who hasn't seen it? Then you've I mean, got to see it. You've got to see it. I, keep, I think <laughs> yeah. I think you've actually told me before. I yeah, this. I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So right, yeah, the I'll show is directed is, is directed by Steven Soderbergh. I think it was it came out in 20, 2015 or twenty sixteen. Um, uh, anyone who's participating, you can correct me in the in the chat. But um, it's uh, about turn of the it's a it's about the turn of the century uh, hospital in New York City. Uh, I think it's going into like 19, the 1900s. And um, it's like an historical, it's historical fiction and historical drama. And it kind of just talks about like um, medical advances during this time period. But you also get to hear about medical attitudes during this time period as well. And one of the things that I find interesting when I hear this term personal responsibility is that the older version of this was um, basically that if you had a moral weakness, that's what led you to getting sick or that's what led you to continue having 
a particular addiction. Um, I'm not spoiling anything, but the main character, uh, he deals with an addiction to cocaine, right? Um, and uh, so it's like, before it was like personal responsibility, it was just like morally there's something wrong with you, that is why you are sick. Uh, and I think it transforms to this idea of personal responsibility. But uh, what I think about uh, what, what you said, Dr. Roberts, in regards to like things that were usually provided by um, institutions and the government in regards to taking care of yourself, um, I've never liked the term self-care because like it is something that you have to do for yourself and is not really provided by anyone you work for and you're not really given time for it. So it's always like on you to like take care of yourself, let yourself like watch a movie or decompress. And I think the reason why um, you had to do it yourself because it's, they can't make money off of it. Like, um, even though your personal well-being is incredibly important. And I think it's frustrating that it is a sacrifice that one has to take on just to like um, properly like operate in this world, especially during the pandemic where like with the oral histories I've collected, one of the main questions is like, what have you been doing to keep yourself occupied? Um, or like, what have you been doing to like deal with the stresses of this moment? Um, in my case, it was puzzles. Um, <laughs> but uh, in regards to the question, which I'm assuming OH stands to like, can oral history document how people react to that? Uh, yes, I think that is a, a wonderful line of questioning that I will look into, but basically it would involve people's interaction with actual healthcare, people talking about the things that they have to deal with. Um, like a personal story for me is that um, we have received CIG status and um, basically the Weeksville staff will receive healthcare. Um, but before that moment, I, um, I've had an issue with my teeth and I haven't been covered since I left South Korea where I was an English teacher. Um, so during the pandemic, I had to get two, piece, two teeth removed. Um, and um, it's, it's the, the, the difference between how one exists in the United States without healthcare and like the fact that you have national healthcare in a country like South Korea, uh, which I've expressed to other colleagues, it's, it's kind of sickening. It's, and it's also like disheartening of like all of the mental equations one has to make if they don't have healthcare. And it's also ridiculous that it is tethered to employment, that you have to have a job to have healthcare. Um, but um, in regards to this question on the public health care system, um, yeah, I think there, there's so much room, if not already, oral history collections that, that speak to this. Um, so I will try to dovetail this into the next question, which, um, oh, I hope I didn't lose it. It was reg regards to more ability. Um, so I'm gonna read it verbatim um, or in full uh, from YouTube. Uh, I missed the first 30 minutes, so I apologize if this was covered then, but could the panelists speak more to obesity being factored as both grounds to deny people treatment and as a comorbidity to, for COVID? Sorry, uh, I'll re read it one more time. Uh, I'm could the panelists speak more to obesity being factored as both grounds to deny people treatment and as a comorbidity for COVID? Sure. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. And, you know, obesity has been invoked as a risk factor from the beginning, as if it were, as if the data were supporting that, as if we had proof of that. But I'm not sure that we do. When I look at the data that um, supports the inclusion of obesity, one of the things I noticed immediately was that um, it's interesting, it talks about hospitalization, uh, of people who are obese being more likely to be hospitalized. However, that reflects hospital policy. If you have a policy that calls for the hospitalization of people who are, have a higher BMI or body mass index, um, then you're gonna have more hospitalization. So it's not definitive. Also, we have to remember that in a prior epidemic, I believe SARS-2, Obesity was also invoked as a risk factor, but afterwards when the data were analyzed, what they found was that 
obese people were less likely to be offered certain technologies. Um, it turns out that pe obese people actually fared as well or slightly better than other people who were infected, but they hadn't been offered certain technologies that were typically offered to the less obese. So they were the victims of discrimination and yet had, um, you know, death rates that were comparable to people with a normal or um, yeah, a normal BMI. So there's a question about whether it's obesity. There's no question, however, that obesity is um, something against people are discriminated for. Uh, medical um, system does discriminate against obese people just as society does. And so we have to be careful in invoking it as a risk factor. I think at this point, we may not know. Um, I just might be ignorant of like the la latest um, data. I have not looked at this recently, but we have to be careful because of the stigma of obesity. One of the things I do notice, however, was that very often I saw obesity linked to race even if not um, you know, explicitly, but it was linked to race as um, in the blame the victim Olympics, basically, because I remember that when the news first came out that people who were African-American had higher rates of infection, I immediately received a tweet from a New York state legislator who said, is it race or is it obesity? I hear the obese fare worse. I also hear people who smoke and drink fare worse. And I thought to myself, okay, well, we weren't talking about obesity, but I see that you are and you're linking it to race and that's done commonly. So there's a possibility that um, this is something that's being generated as a proxy for race in some contexts. And there's certainly a possibility that it's being invoked incorrectly. I, I, just to add to that as well, what uh, Harry, what you referred um, a few moments ago uh, to food swamps, I think is as well the kind of the social structure and political Absolutely. economy of nutrition is you know this this is all about that. Yeah. Exactly. If you live surrounded by McDonald's and Popeyes, and but the nearest supermarket is ten miles away, <laughs> then that's going to raise your your risk of obesity, true. And you know what? Even if it's one mile away in an area with bad public transportation. Exactly. You know, exactly. like it could be relatively close if you own a car, but if you don't, you know, most, most cities in this country don't really have good public transportation. So it can be fairly close even, but not close enough for you to be able to go in your free time, yeah. It's a very good point. Again, stress test, you know? <laughs> like this is just yeah. stress test, yeah, you know. Um, I mean, um, there is there is a question um, directly related to this from from Ricky. Uh, in Greece, in Greece, obesity obesity is not invoked as a risk factor. Uh, in the U.S., is it not more linked to class and poverty apart from race? Hmm. I'm not sure you can always set class and poverty in opposition to race meaningfully. I mean, I, I see his point, but. Um, hmm. But, you know, the thing is, I, you know, I don't, I tend to agree with him that it's not, that factually we may not be talking about race, but I'm just saying that in terms of people's um, biases and preconceptions, they're linking the two. Um, I don't see them expressing concern about the BMI of um, U.S. senators. They're expressing concern about the BMI of, you know, African-American women. That's the problem. I, I, I agree. I'm sorry. I just was, I'm nodding my assent to this, you know, vigorously, but I didn't actually vocally say so. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in regards to, are there any more questions that people would like to provide um, in the chat? Um, I guess. I mean, um, one of the things I do think about is the um, is the carceral estate and how um, those in prison have been affected by the coronavirus and how there has been little done um, for their protection. Um, and when I'm thinking about basically the like the current collective memory, because it's still fresh in regards to the interviews I've collected. Um, 
you know, there are a few that have talked about like people incarcerated, but there are those who speak directly about it as like, um, they have had have friends who have like died from the disease, but like, um, and like in a very rough survey, I have spoken to friends who like have made the argument that like, um, you know, prisons are like the same as being within a home that, and that like they, they run the same risk, which um, I was apoplectic when I heard it and like was very angry. And um, was like, just, I wonder about the, the societal response to those who are um, in, in prison and like are dealing with this pandemic and um, think about like this idea of responsabilization as well as like, um, you know, just like moral metal in regards like, you know, good people get healthcare and like, um, I'm wondering, is that like the same way that we're looking in regards to those who are incarcerated? I'm sorry, could you restate that for me one time, one more time, Ogden? Um, like just looking at those who are incarcerated and whether like they're, um, that there hasn't been as much attention paid uh, attention within the mainstream media. So basically like thoughts around that, yeah. Well, I'll just say that it's, um, I see a shocking lack of compassion um, toward the incarcerated. And this is just one more instance. I remember that, I think it was only last year during heat waves when several prisons um, didn't have power. And so inmates were in these prisons sweltering in the heat, you know, very dangerous levels of heat. Um, basically, you know, banging on the windows, sh literally shouting for help. And um, government was did not intervene meaningfully in my opinion um and i would you know it just showed a degree of callousness even sometimes you know and i think this is one example of it you know i think that the view of people in jails and prisons as people who are dangerous parasites who wouldn't be missed if something happened to them is very prevalent people will not always articulate that but a lot of people have that um opinion i remember when I wrote in Medical Apartheid how um, the common denominator among people in prisons and jails was not guilt, but poverty. My editor went, <laughs> he was very displeased, you know, and I gave him some data showing him, you know, it was really, there's like a perception of people in jails as somehow not being worthy, as you said of the common considerations of life preservation. The healthcare that's administered in many prisons and jails is very openly episodic. You know, there's no good quality healthcare and there's a lot of um, for-profit organization that render healthcare in jail. So their um, philosophy is based frankly on the bottom line. They're trying to render the cheapest possible care and um, are not too night, not too, you know, not too careful, meticulous about, you know, providing care for people with chronic illnesses like diabetes. So we're already giving the incarcerated very poor health care, and this did not help the situation at all, indifference toward their plight. So it's shocking and quite inhumane, frankly. You know, the, the, the one of several tragic ironies about that too is that um, by a Supreme Court case, um, Sharon B, um, or I'm sorry, um, the Gamble case. Oh my gosh, uh, I think it's you. Um, I'm sorry, but Gamble, it's the Gamble case uh, from the 1970s actually mandates that uh, prisons must, prisons and jails must provide health care. It's the one place in this country where you have a quote unquote right to health care. Now, as Harry just said, it's usually really bad healthcare. It's quite often provided by people who are not motivated to give good care, or more, or or and or motivated by a bottom line. But um, that's the biggest irony of it all. That you know, a number of people who go to prison, their first time getting a particular diagnosis might be in their intake, be it you know for hypertension for, or for HIV um, or hepatitis. Mm -hmm. And so these are places where people are not getting that care, even though. It's supposed to be the one place where it's mandated constitutionally and it's it's not there the other thing is that 
there's a story, there's a study from, um, this is a few months ago, or earlier this year anyway, um, and I believe it was the U UTMB, University of Texas Medical Branch. The lead author is Jason Glenn, um, who interviewed medical students. The, 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 the University of Texas medical system or medical training system uh, trains its students by letting them um, treat people in prisons. And this study documented that early on in their training, they had already been indoctrinated with the type of callous attitudes that Harriet just identified towards our fellow um, human beings who are incarcerated. Even then, like having worked there only several months or a year are already parroting the things that their trainers told them about, you know, they don't feel pain or be careful. They, a lot of them are malingerers or they just really want, they're, they're complaining about pain so they can get drugs or they're trying to pull your heartstrings, you know, all this other stuff. And it's, it's baked into the system. So then, you know, we have a system where people are getting paid to incarcerate them. As Harriet said, quite often for, you know, issues of poverty, but we pay guards, we pay, you know, private prisons, we pay taxes and all this to construct them. And then we let our physicians train on them, but not to really cultivate compassion for them. And it's kind of like, imagine a conveyor belt where you have like a stone and every time it stops, somebody's chiseling off a piece of it, getting extracting value from it. So by the time it's done, everybody's gotten a piece of it. And it's just a, a pebble almost, you know, everybody gets value out of people we lock up. They're it's part of a political, a larger political economy. And so it's no wonder that COVID-19, you know, does what it does. Like it was a, I mean, it was a patently broken and malicious system to begin with. So we shouldn't be at all be surprised. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox there, but <laughs> no, I was needed. <laughs> I mean, you did get a little taller, but I appreciated it. Um, and um, I think um, that is a good place to stop. I think the last comment, well, last question I'm going to read, which is more or less a comment, which um, I am appreciative of, is. <laughs> Will you consider doing a part two regarding this topic? This is rich and can be expounded upon in greater detail. And uh, I don't know, for me, like, hopefully we'll see. Um, and, uh, but like with that, I would love to just say thank you to Harriet Washington and Dr. Samuel K. Roberts for taking out the time to be a part of this virtual teaching. I very much appreciate a lot of the things that was said and like ruminated on and um, just think that we had a really wonderful conversation. So thank you again for that. And Obden, I want to say thank, thank you, you. And, and thanks to Weeksville for all the work. We haven't had a chance to really yeah. highlight that. I know you have earlier in the program and I think the program extends maybe after this and this program is part of your general programming. Um, Weeksville is a tremendous organization, um, a staple um, a pillar of not just our New York community, but all of us who do African American history. And um, so thank you for everything that you all do as well. Right. Pleasure to be here. And always a pleasure to be on a panel with you, Harriet. So whoever <laughs> asked the question about a part two, anybody who wants to invite me and Harriet to come by, you could definitely sign me. Anytime. I don't know what, I don't know what her <laughs> thoughts are on it, but where she goes, I go. So uh, anytime. I'm, and thank you for inviting me. I'm always thrilled to be at Weeksville. It's an honor. Thank you guys very yeah. much. Enjoy the rest of your Bye -bye. weekend. You, you too. too. Stay safe, everybody. Bye bye. Great job, Obden. Just want to big you up. That was amazing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Walking among giants. Um, you can definitely add that to your resume. <laughs> uh, I was, I was doing that in the meantime. Would you say? No, I'm, uh, I mumbled a joke, but no one needs to hear it. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody again on behalf of Weeksville Heritage Center. Thank you for uh, spending your afternoon with us and helping us to kick off our Weeksville weekends. Uh, I will just want to announce that next month we'll be back here again, the second Saturday of the month. 
uh, Saturday, October 10th, but I'm very excited to announce that we will actually be back on site on the sacred grounds of the Weeksville Heritage Center. So please join us uh, there, 158 Buffalo Avenue here in Brooklyn, New York. We'll be uh, celebrating our Harvest Festival in partnership with Oco Farms. Uh, we'll be strengthening our roots, reimagining community and self. So please join us there next month. Uh, we'll have a full day of outdoor public programming, uh, farmer's market, art workshops for our young people, food demonstrations, healing activations provided by Minka Brooklyn, and so much more. We are helping to support your um, immune systems to prepare us for this upcoming flu season and to fight against, um, you know, sicknesses as an example today, COVID-19, which we've been talking about. So please save the date, mark your calendars. Uh, if you want to donate to Weeksville Heritage Center, we welcome uh, any support that you would give us. Please visit our website uh, at weeksvillesociety.org uh, and uh, toss a few coins in, in our collection plate there. Um, also, I wanna let you know that we are on um, various social media platforms. I'm just going to throw up a slide um, so you guys can check us out there. Uh, visit our website there, weeksvillesociety.org, and then follow us on social media. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. On Facebook and Twitter, you can follow us at, uh, at Weeksville. Uh, and then on uh, Instagram, we are at Weeksville Heritage Center. So thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekends, and we'll see you next month at Weeksville Heritage Center. Bye, everybody. <laughs>